I'm going to be talking about marriage, the sacrament of marriage. And what I want to do is to start with marriage in the secular world. Because I think there's a lot. I usually wait until things come kind of settled down. Is this okay? Marriage in the secular world. Before we talk about what marriage, what marriage means in the secular world, and, and what everybody probably thinks that marriage means, and then talk about what marriage means uh, in in the sacramental sense uh, in the church. Um, Webster's Dictionary defines marriage as the state of being united to a person of the opposite sex as husband or wife in a consensual and contractual relationship recognized by law. And with the recent U.S. Supreme Court decision that holding that persons of the same sex have a fundamental right to marry in a civil sense, that definition has obviously changed. In, in, the, in the secular world, marriage is a contract. Now, that's important to understand, uh, and, and I, being a lawyer, I'm going I'm to do a, like about, about a two-minute thing about what is a contract? Okay? So you're in law school now. I bet you didn't know that. A contract is where you have three things, what they call an offer, acceptance, and consideration. And I don't mean consideration as in you're nice to somebody. It means something of value. So for example, the example that was given when I was in law school 40 some years ago, um, was that um, John? If I uh, if I if I had I needed my lawn mowed, you're you, you're my neighbor, and I said, John, uh, I'll give you ten dollars if you mow my lawn. That's the offer. And if you say, okay, I'll do it, and that's acceptance. And there's a contract. The consideration that flows between the two of us is that I agree to my detriment to give to take ten dollars out of my wallet and give it to you and you agree to get your lawn mower out and use the sweat equity to mow my lawn. My benefit is I get my lawn mowed, your benefit is you get the ten dollars. So we have a contract. Now there in, in the in the civil law when you get married there is a contract. Uh, it's a lot vaguer than that. It's not so clear as to what the responsibilities are between a husband and wife, but it is definitely a contract. It is a legally binding contract. Marriage is also a partnership, which is a, is a type of a contract. It's similar to, I think, in, in the secular world, marriage is now similar to uh, a partnership. In a partnership, it's a business relationship of both parties have a mutual interest and seek to pursue their lives together. Business partnerships can be dissolved in two ways. One, one of the parties was in the partnership and it can be dissolved by that party violating or breaching the contract and then the other party suing for money damages. Okay? The other way is both parties can agree they just want to dissolve the partnership. Well, that's the way the world, the secular world, looks at at um, marriage. As long as the partners in a, in a marriage are doing that, they they are pursuing the same mutual interests. Everything is fine. But as soon as the interests of one of the two, of the husband or the wife, in a marriage change, they can either do one of two things: either they breach the breach the a contract, so to speak, in the marriage, find a ground for divorce, and, and therefore the, 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 the other party sues for divorce. Or you can even do it by mutual agreement, what we call irreconcilable differences. So in the secular world, marriage is no longer looked in the same way that it used to be, I think. And so what has happened is, well, 
here are the statistics about marriage in the United States that I got from a uh, good friend of mine, John Chiribosa, who uh, they do a lot of uh, marriage ministry and uh, they do a lot of presentations across the country uh, on this subject. According to those guys, fewer people are getting married. 72% in 1960. It's how many people got married. In 2011, it's down 51% of the people getting married. Couples are married later. You know what the median age for male now is marrying in the United States? 29, almost 29, 28.9. And the woman is 26.9, almost 27. So what's happening? If they're not getting married, or they're waiting to later to get married, they're living together. 50% of all marriages are preceded today by living together. The duration of cohabitation is uh, about 22 months, and within three years, the 40% of those go from, from being uh, living together to transitioning to marriage. Here's the interesting point, and I found this highly uh, enlightening. The divorce rate of persons living together but then marry is 85% higher than people who marry first without living together before they marry. And of course, the national average for divorces in this country is over 50%, but interestingly enough, the divorce rate among Catholics is 28%. So, just saying, those are the numbers. Now, what about marriage as a sacrament? Is it the same as a secular marriage? The short answer is no, it is not. A sacrament is the outward presence or outward sign of the presence of God. So the sacrament of marriage for Catholics is a lifelong sacrament to be lived by three participants. Husband, the wife, and God. We're all called, everybody in this room is called to one of four vocations in our lives. We're called to marriage, the single life, ordination, or the religious life. And each of those callings are from God. We don't really, if you think about it, make those choices ourselves. They're really God calling us to those particular vocations. Here's what the Catechism says about marriage. Since God created him man and woman, their mutual love becomes an image of the absolute and unfailing love with which God loves man and woman. It is good, very good in the Creator's eyes, and this love which God blesses is intended to be fruitful and to be realized in the common work of watching over creation. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. Now there's two aspects to uh, a, a sacrament of marriage. One is what we call the unity of love between the husband and wife, and the other is procreation. The unity of love is that coming together of a man and woman, uh, and that they um, are as one. And what comes of that, what one of the fruits of that can be, uh, is our children. The two go hand in hand. Now, interestingly enough, is anybody in here, uh, is anybody that was that can remember before Vatican II? I was going to say Preston. <laughs> before Vatican II, it, uh, they, the, the, the church looked uh, upon procreation as being the primary reason for marriage, and that the unit of love aspect was, was only a secondary reason. And so that was talked about quite a lot at Vatican II. And at Vatican II, uh, they made the decision, uh, and the Holy Father agreed that um, no longer was the unitive aspect secondary, but they're co equal. But they are co equal. In other words, in the Catholic Church, uh, one of the three things that you look for in, in terms of when you, when, when you, uh, 
when you marry, one of the three essential elements is openness to having children. So if you go into a marriage saying, well, I don't want any children, and you're not getting married in a sacramental sense in the Catholic Church, uh, the openness to having children doesn't necessarily mean just uh, bearing children, but it can also mean, as my wife and I did, we adopted children. Uh, it doesn't mean you have to bear children or adopt children, but you have to be. The, the idea is that you're open to it uh, as part of the marriage. Now here's what uh, one of the documents, it's called the Constitution on the Church in the Modern World. This was a Vatican II document says about marriage. By its very nature, the institution of marriage and married love are ordered to the procreation and education of offspring, and it is in them that it finds its crowning glory. Thus the man and the woman help and serve each other by their marriage partnership. They become more conscious of their unity and experience it more deeply from day to day. The intimate union of the marriage as a mutual giving of two persons and the good of the children demand total fidelity from spouses and require unbreakable unity between them. Christ abides with them in order that by their mutual self-giving, spouses will love each other with enduring fidelity as he loved the church and delivered himself for it. Authentic married love is caught up in what we call the divine love and is directed and enriched by the redemptive power of Christ and the salvific action of the church, with the result that spouses are effectively led to God and are helped and strengthened by their lofty role as fathers and mothers. When uh, Janet and I married, uh, Monsignor Rowley, uh, who uh, is now deceased, he was the priest, he was the pastor here for many, many years. Um, he was the, uh, if you know of Camp Marymount, have you familiar with Camp Marymount? Anybody? Okay. He started Camp Marymount. So, uh, uh, he, my wife, Janet, knew him and convinced him to, I think we were one of the last uh, marriages that he performed. Actually, Father Steve Wolf married us, but Father but Monsignor Rowley uh, was there and he gave the homily. And when he gave the homily, he was, it was so funny, he, uh, he, he sat and talked to just us. He, you know, basically ignored everybody else in, in the congregation. And he basically said, it's real simple. Marriage, you need to do this. It's God first, spouse second, children third, and jobs fourth. And you keep them in that order. And over all these number of years, I can see the truth in that because he basically, I don't know how many times the children, we have had to tell the children, you're not number one. <laughs> you're not the top of this. God is up there first. And believe it or not, um, my Janet is more important than you guys. Um, what I recently read in uh, by him, uh, uh, this is a, a piece by Henry Now, who's a who's a uh, who's a priest. Uh, he said that um, what's my train of thought? Uh, oh yes, he said that we think of our children as, or how do you put it? Children are not our possessions. We don't own them. When you first have children. You, they are highly dependent upon you, and you, they do everything you tell them that you think, you try. Uh, but, but, but basically, you, you get this sense of ownership, in a sense, and you put all your blood and sweat and tears into them. What he said was, we don't own them. Um, they are gifts from God, and as such, we should treat them like guests. Because in 18 years, God willing, <laughs> they're going to be moving out. And they're only there for a short period of time. And for those of you that have little children, I know that sounds like a distant, far, far away, but it will come up fast. And when it does, they will leave. And you are still married. Um, 
and that's very important to remember uh, in terms of uh, in terms of marriage is that it's you are there to to bring up these children uh, to bring them up in the faith and to to nurture them and help them on their way but then eventually they're like little birds that have to fly away from the nest and that you're still in the nest with your spouse so to speak now the other thing I wanted to mention in part uh, Monsignor Rowling tells the story of, of uh, really in one sense uh, a marriage and I'm going to be talking about this on Saturday um, the family itself is you know the idea of priest, prophet, and king I think I, I can't remember if I talked about that before in, when I talked about the, the Old Testament New Testament um, and this speaker that I heard at um, the, the world meeting talked about, you know, we talk about ourselves as being priest, prophet, and king. You know, the priest was uh, the priestly the, the, the priestly sacrifices in the Old Testament uh, to to atone for the sins of the people of Israel, and then the prophets who spoke out when the people of Israel were uh, were straying from from the truth, and then the king is the person who led. And that Jesus was the fulfillment of all of that into one person. Uh, he was both all three, but uh, three priest, prophet, and king. And that we are called individually to be priest, prophet, and king. But what this speaker said is, as a family, we are called to act to the world as priest, prophet, and king. What we do, and in a marriage, I think that we act as priest, prophet, and king. And um, so that means. Making sacrifices as as a as a uh, to each other in a marriage it is so very very important, um, and that we cannot do it without the grace of God, because otherwise we're doomed to fail. So the sacrament of marriage is not just an agreement or a contract between a husband and a wife to live together and raise children. It isn't even this romanticized, self-giving love that a husband and wife have for each other. That's because that love burns out, and you can't, it, it takes the supernatural grace of God to make a marriage work. Uh, marriage is a sacramental love, as I said, between a husband and wife that has God in the middle. The self-giving love of a husband and wife is not, it, uh, is not all there is to marriage. That self-giving love is connected to the divine love. And it enables people who are married to help each other on their journey, on their spiritual journey. I think, put it another way, again, this priest, prophet, and king, father, son, Holy Spirit, the father and the son have this flow of love between them. And that's what we call the Holy Spirit. <laughs> And when you're called to the sacrament of marriage, you're drawn up into that flow of love. Think of it in one sense as a... Think of the Trinity. This is one thing that I'm sort of looking up here and thinking, okay, how about I explain this? The Trinity. We always think of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit as... Um, as as things. Think of the Trinity instead of as a noun. Think of the Trinity as a verb. It's a relationship and it's 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 always it's always in flow and always moving. And in one sense it's sort of like a dance. And that as as a couple, people are invited into that dance and uh, in a very special and unique way. Um, Individuals in a single life are called into that relationship into that relationship in a different way. And people who are ordained, each one are called into that divine relationship in a different way. Um, John and Terry Bosio, who I mentioned before, they're a married couple, uh, taught marriage counseling, and um, they've done a number of uh, retreats uh, all across the country. Uh, here's what they say about the sacrament. They say, marriage as a sacrament enables each of us to help each other, to bring each other closer to God on our faith journey. 
St. Paul says to love your spouse the same way that Christ loves the church. The way we do that is through the sacrament of marriage. We're blessed with the graces that enable us to act like Christ for each other by loving and sacrificing for each other. One of the many fruits of a sacrament of marriage is the generation of offspring we call children. In particular, children are really the beneficiary of the fruits of the marriage. And they are, in a sense, part of that divine love relationship. I love this quote. This is from Father Joe McMahon, who uh, taught my sacraments class. He said that one of the most precious gifts of the cross that God gives us is the gift of children. For we live their joys and their sufferings with them as Christ does with us. That's what we're doing. We are to the children what the Father is to us. As parents, I think we truly get a glimpse of what it must be like to be God the Father if you think about it. And you're sitting there, and I know God is always sitting there with me when I mess up and stuff, shaking his head when up there. He goes again, just like we do, the kids. And you're just going, I just don't get it. Now, marriage vows. There's three key elements that we talk about when we do pre-marriage counseling. Uh, and they are the three things that you'll that we ask you know, when, when people take vows. Uh, um, and, and get married in the Catholic Church. One is fidelity, one is permanence, and the, the second one, and then the third one is openness, as I mentioned before, openness to having children. And it is that which binds the family, the, the husband and wife together uh, for a lifetime. I always like on the, uh, on the, on the pre-marriage uh, the the pre-marriage counseling form, this initial form that we have to fill out, one of the questions is, um, uh, are, you, uh, are you in agreement that this marriage can be ended only by death? And that always kind of, it's kind of interesting, some of the younger people kind of go, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what we're talking about. Uh, and I think that's very important to understand. That's why the question's on there, I think. Um, so what I would end with is to talk about the Boscos uh, have also come up with this idea or concept um, that I think is just absolutely beautiful of taking, and you're going to learn the, do you, I mean, let, let's see if I can quiz you guys. Do you know what the seven sacraments are or have you gotten that part yet? Seven sacraments. There's the sacrament of baptism, and then there's the sacrament of confirmation, and then there's the sacrament of what we call the Eucharist or Holy Communion, and then there's the sacrament of reconciliation, and then there's the sacrament of anointing the sick, and then there's holy orders, which would be ordination, and then finally marriage. Okay? So what the Bosios did was to take those seven sacraments and apply them within the context of the marriage. So for example, for baptism, I accept you as you are, that when you come into a marriage, you take the person just as they are. You're not going to, you know, like some people do, it's like, okay, once we get married, then I'm gonna, then I'm gonna fix him up the way he needs to be, or fix her up the way she needs to be. That's not gonna happen. Um, that's one. Two, confirmation. Um, I am always present to you to strengthen you. And that's what confirmation is. It's to strengthen us with the Holy Spirit and that we're there to help each other, to strengthen each other in those difficult times. And then three, I give myself to you. I sacrifice myself to you. It's, it's those little, little bitty sacrifices like, for example, um, Janet does not, and she knows I, I tell this all the time. Uh, Janet does not pick up coffee cups. She just doesn't. She's it's like once the coffee is in, uh, coffee cup is empty, it has it's kryptonite, and you can't touch it. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So she, I, I don't, I, at first I didn't understand it, and we tried to discuss it, and now it's just the way life is. And so I just pick the coffee cups up, and that's the little sacrifice when I go through the house. And I mean, she leaves it. I mean, it's not like she just, it could be anywhere. The coffee cups could be um, and so that is that. But that's a little bit sacrifice. But I, I have come to the point in our marriage where I actually do it kind of joyfully. And she does many things for me. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> many, many things. Uh, the, the, the fourth one is um, I forgive you. That is one that Father or Monsignor Roland said basically told us there is to, to not go to bed angry at each other, to always forgive each other and to reconcile before your head hits the pillow. And then five, I comfort you and I heal you. Um, that's very important that most people when they're young don't think about the fact that that at some point one of the two of you are going to get seriously ill probably and that the other one is going to have to be the caregiver. Um, and that's just how it is. Um, in our instance, uh, I'm sort of, I don't know if Janet's going to mention this or not, but right when we were getting ready to get married, uh, Janet um, went to, well, she's just having an annual fistful or whatever, and they discovered something on her uh, thyroid, and it turned out to be thyroid cancer. And so, oh gosh, we're getting ready to get married, she's got thyroid cancer. So uh, we waited. Uh, she said, can I wait? You know, because she didn't want the scholarship to show and all that stuff. You know. So but we waited, and so we didn't, we didn't have a honeymoon. Um, like, three days after we got married, it's three or four days, maybe it's four days, um, we went into, she went to Vanderbilt and had a thyroidectomy and had to go through all this stuff and everything, you know. She, the, the chemo treatment for um, thyroid cancer is different than other types of cancer. It is uh, a one-shot deal. Uh, they had her in, I'll never forget, she told me that basically she was in this isolation room and the little um, medical person came in with this little box, and she knew it was this, I, uh, it was radioactive iodine, and so she knew that that's what that was, and like she was getting ready to talk to the person, and the next, the next second, like that person was gone, you know, because they were, it, no one was allowed near her because she was uh, radioactive. <laughs> so, but during all of that, I mean, well, all that point too is that I was there at the very beginning, and unlike others, I was there at the very beginning of marriage um, to to comfort her and heal her, and, and she's been cancer-free ever since. Uh, that's been 1999, so 16 years. Yeah, 16 years. So, uh, anyway. And then finally, I serve you, and together we serve the Father. And I think that's the thing that uh, that is so very important, and that is Holy Orders and marriage itself, is that we are serving not only each other, but we are serving the world together. And um, we are trying to raise children and to bring them up in the faith and to teach them uh, to be lovers of, uh, of God and to be lovers of their neighbors um, and to help them understand one of the things that is kind of funny. When I was growing up, I don't know about you all, but parents would, my parents were talking to me about, well, what do you want to do when you grow up sort of thing? And I don't ask it that way. I say, where do you think God is calling? Because that's what it really is. It's we each have a very unique purpose or mission in life. And God calls us to that. And instead of thinking about what do I want to do, it's what is God calling me to do uh, for the world in, in the time that I have here. So, that's said. What time did I start? She gave me 20 minutes, so it's been more than 20 minutes, hasn't it? <laughs> 7.40 and started at 7.15, didn't I? So that's about 25. Yeah, I'm good. Okay. All right. With that said, um, um, I think Janet said the next thing she wanted to do, well, let me ask this. Let me, let me say this. Now that I've finished with my prepared text before, uh, 
we're going to sort of do a two thing, two part thing here. One is, do you have any questions of me? And then if you don't, then as they say on that uh, Saturday Night Live episode, uh, talk amongst yourselves. Uh, there's, I think, questions uh, or something on the table. I was told them the right. Let's see. Am I wrong? That's what I was told to say. <laughs> Is there? No, there's not. Okay. Well, how about are there any questions? I was talking. The sacraments? The seven, yes. Okay. The, the, the first three are what we call initiatory sacraments. Um, it's uh, baptism, and that's the gateway sacrament. That's the sacrament that brings the child. It cleanses one of original sin. It cleanses the child of original sin, but it also brings the child into the community of believers we call the church. And I think that's very important to remember. The baptism. It's not just. It's not just cleansing them of sin, but it's to bring them in the church. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, the second sacrament is uh, confirmation. And then the third sacrament is uh, Eucharist. And then the fourth sacrament is the sacrament of reconciliation, what we think of as confession. And the fifth sacrament is, um, I'm going to get them to order. Here we go. Um, Anointing of the sick. And then the sacrament of holy orders. And last is the sacrament of marriage. And they each have their own histories, and I'm talking just about marriage. Um, and what I've given you is just basically the essential elements of what, what, what the sacrament of marriage is. You can see, if you see the big difference between what we think of as a secular marriage and a sacramental marriage, or these sacramental marriages, I would put it. Um, it's God doesn't exist in, 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 the, in the secular world. I mean, it's not that God doesn't exist, but God is not part of. You can get married without it being uh, without without any reference whatsoever to God, and it is simply a contract. I mean, I hate to put it in such stark terms, but it is a it is a partnership. And in, in the world today, partnerships can be dissolved like that, and that's how marriages are. And so what happens is, and the reason I give you the statistics is, because partnerships can be dissolved so quickly, a lot of people don't want to get into all the legal um, obligations of, 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 of a marriage, uh, and, then, and then five years from now, or ten years from now, break up, because then you have to deal with all the, all the I mean, the, the difficulties of uh, separating the property out, um, uh, if, if it's contested, it's a question of fault, uh, and then the, the big issue is always the children uh, and how how you're going to continue on until those children become 18, until they become uh, reach majority. So, I'm sorry. Preston. And the pre payment instruction on the value of the food for couples. Could you explain that the pre canon instructions? When you when you say that, I want them to understand what you're saying. Well, usually you'll go if you're going to have a mass, or if you're set at your wedding, or even if it's not a mass. Oftentimes, a priest will spend time with the couple. Oh. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Okay, I just had not heard it referred to that way. Uh, yes, you have to go through marriage preparation, and it has to be there is a, there's a pre uh, there is a, a, a an engaged couple retreat that you have to go on, and then uh, you, you either meet with the priest or the deacon, and you have to meet several times to talk about the sacrament and, and a lot of issues um, uh, relating to marriage uh, before. It, it depends. I mean, if a person uh, is 
if you were married in the in, in the Catholic Church and you've gone through the marriage prep, then it can be a sacramental marriage, but then there are just because you were married in the Catholic Church doesn't mean that it automatically that the, that, that the necessary elements for the sacrament are, are, are there. Um, and Patty is going to be talking, Patty's stories in the back, she's with the tribunal, she's going to be talking about um, um, the uh, the annulment process and how that works. But to be clear, in the Catholic Church, when you talk about annulment, you're not talking about grounds for divorce or divorce. You're talking about whether the elements uh, necessary for there to be a sacramental marriage were there. And that's very that's very different in the way you look at it than, uh, than you know, it's not a question of who's at fault and that sort of stuff. Am I saying that all right? Is that... I get passing right. <laughs> so, are there any other questions about um, about the sacrament of marriage? I've been told if you if you have your book, go to page two thirty eight. Thanks, Janet. I'm Glad to be here again this year. Um, I actually had retired in December of 2013 from the tribunal, and they couldn't live without me, so I went back this June. So, I mean, you know, what can I say? Father Dexter was thrilled that I was coming back. I think I made his job easier, which was good. And uh, it, at 65 years old, I didn't have to learn a new job. I didn't have to learn new people. I knew everybody there, so it was like, Homecoming, and it was great. And I'm back, and I really am glad to be back. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to tell you what the Catholic Church says marriage is, and why we do this declaration of nullity process. Uh, and then you can ask questions. Okay? Catholic Church teaches that marriage is, by God's plan, a covenant between a man and a woman, which establishes an exclusive and lifelong partnership for the giving and receiving of love and the procreation and nurturing of children. A marriage comes into being when the bride and the groom exchange their consent to marriage through the wedding vows. For those who have been baptized, a vow of marriage is also considered to be a sacrament, like Janet has already said. Although not every marriage is a sacrament, every marriage, including between two non-Catholics, whether baptized or not, is presumed to be valid and a binding union. A declaration of nullity, also referred to as an annulment or declaration of invalidity, is a statement of the Catholic Church that despite the good intentions of both parties, on the day of the wedding, remember that phrase, on the day of the wedding, when the couple exchanged their vows, one or more of the elements which the Church considers essential for a valid marriage was lacking. Remember, it's a lifelong covenant between two people, a man and a woman, and the giving of a partnership and the openness to create a procreation of children and nurturing of them. The Catholic Church considers a marriage to be valid when it is celebrated in a ceremony that is legally acceptable according to the Catholic Church law, which is canon law. That's what the church is based on. Both parties are free to marry each other meaning they have had no other marriages that they might be bound to. Uh, each party intends on the day of the wedding to accept and fulfill the rights and obligations of marriage. And each party has the physical and psychological ability to live out God's plan for married life as taught by the church. If sufficient proof is brought, there's a big key, that's why we have witnesses, you have to have proof that this is a law office. The tribunal is, and it is a law procedure. So anybody that comes and asks us a question about their marriage has to have proof. It's like if you go into a civil court, you have to have witnesses. You have to have witnesses for us too. Um, <clears throat> so once the proof is brought to show that one or more of these requirements was lacking from the beginning, there is a possibility that the church will declare your marriage invalid. And it's the consent that you make. We know the marriage existed. 
Civil law takes care of that. Church can't change the civil law. You have to have a civil law a certificate or license, excuse me, to get married in any church or anywhere. So we know that it existed. We know that, that two people said they were going to do this. A declaration of nullity is not a moral judgment of the parties themselves, and it's not a continuation of the divorce proceedings. It, it is tender to the heart. It hurts because you have to relive it. And a lot of people feel like it's a, it's a release after it's done, uh, being able to say, okay, it's finally over. The church has said, yeah, you really didn't have the right stuff when you got married on the day of the wedding. Um, it's a factual statement by the church. Um, uh, one or more of the elements uh, being essential, excuse me, essential for marriage was lacking at that time. The declaration of nullity is not a statement of the Catholic Church that the previous relationship between spouses never existed. They were married according to the laws of the state and they shared a life with each other and perhaps had children together. Declaration of nullity cannot change those facts. Um, anybody who has been married before, whether you're Catholic, non Catholic, baptized or unbaptized, who is divorced, and whose former spouse is still living may require a declaration of nullity before the, she or she will be permitted to marry in the Catholic Church. And that's why I come, if there's anybody in the group uh, that needs that counseling, I can help. Mike is a deacon now. He's, he's very good at it. We worked together for a while. And he's, he's counseling people here in, at St. Henry. And it's great to have somebody here who knows that. And he's very visible here. I'm also available. And now that I'm back at work, you can come see me at work too if you want to, um, if you need that process. Um, I, I feel like it would be better for me just to open it up now because you got the basics. Janet covered a lot of it. If there's any questions, if there's something else I can tell you, um, so be it. Just call her out. Really, any of the above, but what we like basically is if there is someone in the parish, we do have lay people that we train from the office in some of the parishes, and they are called sponsors. Deacons and priests automatically can do the, the declarations of nullity, uh, and of course, anybody that works in the office, but these other people who have been trained can also help you. Some people feel uncomfortable sometimes going to their priest, they don't want to open up, they feel like maybe. You know, confession is a little too much at that point. It doesn't matter. Whatever you feel comfortable doing, you can call the office. We can get somebody to help you wherever you are. Or Mike is great. He really has been a great help to me. And he and Janet has too. I mean, she is sitting with me also. And they learned a lot and they know what they're doing. Most of the time. <laughs> Mike still calls me and asks me questions, which is great. That's what we're there for. Yes. What happens if one party doesn't want to participate? Like you said, like a court where you don't have the other side? Right. Um, we do have to contact the other party. <coughs> Excuse me. Everything's done by the um, mail, stale mail. And um, if we don't hear back from them, or if they do contact us after they've heard from us and say, I don't want to hear from y'all anymore, it's okay. We can still continue. At the end of the process, they will still be contacted with the decision. Sometimes it's favorable, sometimes it's not. But they have a right to know. So but they do, but they don't have to participate if they don't want to. And a lot of my Catholics will call me and say, Well, why is she going through this? I mean, we weren't married in the Catholic Church. I wasn't even baptized. And we explained what I explained to y'all earlier about all marriages are considered valid until we're in the bus. The church doesn't have anything to do with that. Civil law covers that. Any child born in a marriage is legitimate. The church, no church can change that. And that's part of what we go through and tell people as we're going through. Because that's one of the first questions people ask, well, won't this make my children illegitimate? No. Church can't do that. <laughs> we don't have we got power, but we don't have that kind of power. 
No, no, no. It, it has to go through the tribunal. At, the, um, at this point, Nashville still does the, tri the uh, tribunal uh, process for the diocese of Knoxville. When we split from when they split from us in ADA, they did not want to set up their own tribunal. We were used to doing everything from the Tennessee River to Knoxville and beyond, and we're still doing it. <laughs> so they don't, they just they really like what we do most of the time. And um, so we take care of them too. But if there is an appeal, it would go to another diocese or to the archdiocese. It just depends on what the circumstances are. All right. All right. If if a man and a woman don't agree on the nullity, like say you presented the case and your your former spouse said no, I I think my marriage was valid. And it was given an affirmative, and you were granted the nullity. Well, she can appeal that because she thinks and feels very strongly that the marriage was valid. So it would be appealed to another court. And in order to have um, a nullity granted, it's appeal. The second court has to affirm the first first court's decision, or it goes to a third court if there are two. Right. Well, if, the, if, the, if there are two Catholics that are going through the process who have been divorced, yes, you can't, you can't submit a case until you've been civilly divorced. I should have said that up front, sorry. Um, and, and both parties were Catholic at that time. And one of the parties says, no, I know I entered the marriage. And we both talked about this. And we talked about kids. And we talked about how we were going to live together. We were soulmates, blah, 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 blah. And the other one says, no, I don't think we were. And then they go through the process. And it is given them an affirmative decision. And the party who's against it can say, I do It can be rather strange and stressful. The process or the result of that process would be the ex spouse married again in the church. Correct. But if the party that's kind of that doesn't want the nullity feels deeply in their heart that the marriage was valid, they do have that right to appeal it and say, No, I'm still married to him. I didn't want the divorce. I mean, those things can't happen. I've seen it all in 30 years from Jay, believe me. So, yeah, it goes anywhere from one person, I mean, a person being married one time to a person being married to another eight or nine times. It's amazing. I was very naive when I started. I was very young, too. And <laughs> now nothing surprises me. People do the strangest things. It's true. So, anybody else have any questions? Oh, sorry. Did y'all all hear that? No. Okay. She was saying that um, it doesn't, the nullity doesn't come about just because feelings change in marriage later on, or uh, infidelity happens later on, or um, someone gets sick later on. Remember what I said. Remember on the day of the wedding. Okay, when you get married, you got God, you got gal. They love that garbage. Everybody does. <laughs> and they bring it together, so they got to be proud of it. And they think through that themselves in the marriage, and they have good times, they have bad times, those kinds of things. I mean, it happens to everybody. <clears throat> but what's, and it's like, sometimes, I, mostly men have what they call midlife crisis. But now I think women are getting them too. <laughs> and, <laughs> and just because somebody decides, well, I don't love you anymore because you're not young and buxom and you know you don't look good in a convertible. I'm going to divorce you and move on because my secretary can't 
that, that's not a reason for nobody. And there are 15 reasons or grounds that we use in our office that have to do with why you can apply for nobody. One, two of them are, in, uh, are incapacity grounds. Or they talk about your capacity on the day of the wedding, at the time that you get married, whether or not you can do what you're promising to do. Uh, there are conditions. The Catholic Church feels like you can't place a condition on marriage. Like, okay, I'll marry you as long as you stay in law school because I want to live the life of a lawyer who makes a whole lot of money and get married and the guy says, I'm tired of law school, I'm going to become a carpenter. Well, there's nothing wrong with being a carpenter. But this woman said, I want to be married to a lawyer. I want to live that. And you can't make enough money as a carpenter for me to live that way. Not the right service. She can't condition her consent. She can't say, I'll marry you if you do this. Church doesn't agree with that. And then there are some exclusions. Some people can get married and they know that they're not going to be faithful. They dated other people while they were dating their spouse. They dated them when they were engaged. And then they continued having fun with other people. And can't do that. Infidelity in and of itself doesn't create a novelty. But if it's a pattern, if it's something that somebody goes into the marriage thinking they can do that goes against what the church feels, then you could have a ground of nullity, excuse me, called willful exclusion of marital fidelity. And if you have the proof, you could be granted a nullity on that. So there are 14 grounds, and that's all I'll explain to you when you need it. I don't know if I need to hold all those, but those are really good questions. It was good for her to bring that up. Yes. Is there an average length of time that something like this takes to be Yeah, right now in our office, it's about uh, 16 months from the time we received the case to the time it's finished. And that's a second instance because once we do it, we have to send our cases to Memphis. And they, that's included in that 16 month time. It can be less than that if everybody that you name as witnesses answer quickly and they, we get everything in the office very quickly. It can be less than that time. But we don't, we've got a very small staff and um, I'm only there three days a week. So we just have to do the best we can do with the staff that we have. But, and it is a long process and it's not easy. It's not any easier than the divorce. Yes, sir. Didn't the Pope recently go to the 45 day round and get a jail and a We, uh, he wanted to know if the Pope didn't bring up the fact that there's a 45 day, what did you call it? Right. Round. <laughs> uh, we have no idea where 45 days came up. Uh, we think that it was a reporter that, that started that. <laughs> when you think about an oddity, even even having the best of um, efficiency with the post office and with, a, with an efficient staff, having to contact the people that we contact, having to receive all this stuff, there's no way that 45 days would take care of it. What I think that where they got that was that places in rural countries or like Africa or places where there are functional tribunals that people can go to, that the bishops would be able to conduct a study of or a group of people that would bring in both parties if they were both agreeable to the nominee plus their witnesses. And the bishop could talk to all of them together and he could make a decision. But that's not going to happen here. Tribunals are everywhere in the United States and Canada, so it's not really going to affect us. So I was wondering, what's the percentage of people who apply for uh, an annulment that actually receive it? And you said it also went to Memphis. Well, is it talking about here, or is it Memphis, or did it go to the Bronx, or how's that work? Okay, can I get my water real quick? My hand is so hot. Okay, okay, okay. Thanks, I'm so sorry. Did everybody hear that question? She was asking about why is Memphis or Nashville or whatever. Okay, Nashville Knoxville Diocese is from the Tennessee River East. Memphis has their own tribunal. At this point, they are our second instance court 
where when we give a decision here, an affirmative decision, it's automatically sent to them for ratification. They send us their first choice cases, and we ratify theirs. Um, not all nullities are given. A lot of times it's because we just don't have the proof. Sometimes the people that are named as witnesses, uh, they just don't have the information to give us, the knowledge of the parties and why they think this happened. And we have ground specific questions, so it's, it's kind of to the point. And the people that come in and we go over all these grounds, usually families and real close friends would know about this. Um, sometimes if a negative is given, uh, people can resubmit later if they find other people who could help them. So that's done too. I would say in our tribunal, probably 85 to 90 percent are ready. Um, sometimes people represent if they've gotten a negative or if it's been appealed by the other party and it is overturned and that the, the, they don't get it, uh, they can represent it and it's given. Sometimes people go two or three times and it just takes the right ground of what's going on or what did go on. So, We ask for four, but if there are two really, really knowledgeable witnesses, like parents or brothers and sisters that know, and just to let you know too, Bishop, I mean, the Pope did come out and say that he didn't want anybody charging anymore for no, we we haven't ever charged. So <laughs> hey, we'll be here for a few minutes afterwards, and if you have questions, this happens every year. <laughs> okay. Um, I say there's a less because I feel like we need to cover all the other. And then, of course, there's more questions that she can answer in the time that we give always. So she'll be here for a few minutes if you have some questions. Thank you. I want to